Hello and welcome everyone. This is the series called Courageous Conversations Over Coffee and it's sponsored by the South Coast Interfaith Council. We hope to bring you a glimpse into the lives of people who are truly courageous, meeting the challenges of the day with creativity and hope. My name is Marietta Fong. I'm a member of the Board of the Council, and I belong to the Rolling Hills United Methodist Church here in the South Bay, Los Angeles area. And we've talked with some incredible people through th throughout this series, heard their stories and been inspired and comforted and informed. Today, we'll welcome Blaise Benz and Marla Wiesenfeld, who have clearly shown us the face of courage as they conquered cancer will share with us their perspectives on facing the pandemic from a vulnerable, vulnerable position. So we'll hear more about them both in a few minutes. But first, we'll have a few tips from Cheryl, the Council's Office Administrator, about conducting a successful conversation in Zoom. Thank you. <laughs> I was explaining that uh, we're Zooming today and I'm going to keep everybody muted, including myself, <laughs> except for Marietta, Blaze, and Marla, um, so that they can, you know, that we get the best sound quality. So if you have any questions, you can go to the participants um, uh, screen and you can raise your hand or you can chat uh, in the chat field that you can send a message to Marietta and she will uh, uh, ask it as we're moving along in the conversation. And we are recording today, so for the best recording, it's best to have a light in, on in front of you and no light behind you. That will uh, show your face the best. And again, we're still learning. As you can tell, I didn't know to mute myself. So, um, uh, so please be patient with us. Okay, that's it. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you so much. So, um, yeah, the chat box is important. It's down near the bottom of your screen. And if you have questions, please just type them into the chat box and then I'll be able to see them and, and ask um, our guests. That way we, we're not talking over each other and, and we'll be able to conduct the interview real, real well. Also, you, if you are looking at it in gallery view where you can see everyone, you might want to change the speaker view that's up in the top right corner of your screen usually. So the program will be about 45 minutes or so. We'll have some general questions at the beginning in conversation and then during a Q&A se section near the end, you'll have an opportunity to send questions via the chat box as we discussed so I can share them with our guests today. Uh, our guests are Marla Weisenfeld and I'll tell you a little bit about Marla and then our Blaze Bentz is our other guest and I'll tell you a bit about Blaze. So Marla is a retired federal probation officer and mental health specialist. She had a 27 year career. She's now retired and working at a local library part time. And she says she's loving it. If you ask her about her proudest accomplishment, she'll say, my kids, Rebecca, Ruby, and Sam. And we all know and love Sam. Sam Schulman is on the board of directors at South Coast Interfaith Council and has been for some time. We won't give him back either, I don't think. Uh, Rebecca and her, her husband live in Colorado and they just had um, Marla's first grandbaby, beautiful Elijah Jacob, who's about three and a half months old. And Marla's married to Norm, who's an optician in San Pedro. The family Family belongs to Congregation Shur Chadash, a Jewish synagogue in Lakewood. I'll tell you that Marla was diagnosed with breast cancer in March of 2019 after a regular mammogram. She tells us she went through chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, and immunotherapy, and just completed treatment at the end of May 2020. So Marla, before um, I introduce the group to Blaze, maybe you can help us to set the stage by just telling us what's your current status in this battle against breast cancer? You used a term NED when we were talking earlier this week, and what does that mean? I am happy to say that the treatment got rid of the cancer. And so and we, don't, we don't call it cured or in remission. We call it no evidence of disease. And so currently I just had my port removed because there's no need for that any longer. 
and I'm, I'm on no other medications or anything like that. My treatment is done and I'm no evidence of disease and I'm, you know, God willing, going to stay that way. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, Blaze, I'm going to introduce you a little bit and I, I'll tell people that when you ask Blaze Bentz about himself, one of the first things he talks about is community service. Um, he's been heavily involved in the SPCA, the traffic commissioner in Cyprus, and something called We Are Game, G-A-M-E, and that's a nonprofit that I believe he's passionate about, and which he'll tell us more about during the conversation, I hope. Um, he's had a business career, a long career in sales, seven years at Xerox as regional sales director and other things. Um, he's currently a virtual CIO. Um, and has had at least four years at Choice Technical Services. Had a, a Bachelor in of Science in Electrical Engineering from UCLA and an MBA from USC. He's also an author and a screenwriter and the father of two daughters. But he describes himself as father, humanitarian, businessman, and adventure seeker. So, Blaze, I think you might say that one of your most challenging adventures began when you received that diagnosis of renal cancer. How long ago was that? And can you describe briefly what you've been through? Uh, sure, that was five years ago, um, 2015. Um, and it uh, kind of happened pretty quick uh, in terms of just uh, my proudest accomplishments also are just raising my two daughters. Uh, they're on the call. And uh, prior to that uh, diagnosis, uh, hiking Half Dome in Yosemite with uh, my oldest daughter, Megan, uh, and, uh, you know, felt, felt terrific. And then just, uh, basically went in for a checkup, wasn't feeling that good, uh, went in for a checkup, and uh, was diagnosed uh, with uh, stage four renal cancer. And it uh, basically involved uh, surgery, had a couple of, uh, uh, Went for a second opinion kind of thing. Went uh, to a couple oncologists. The first oncologist, uh, basically, uh, as I shared with you the other day, uh, let me know. Got about six months to two years max. Um, and kept saying this will be your terminal event, and then uh, went to the second uh, oncologist at UCLA, and basically said, "We got you covered." Um, didn't know what that meant. He said, "Wow, well, probably about forty years or so." We'll see, but uh, you know, and so it gave me a lot of a lot of hope. And uh, five years later, uh, still have a lot of hope now. Had a, had a reoccurrence come back, so um, uh, twice. So I had a reoccurrence, then another reoccurrence came uh, recently, about uh, almost a year ago now. And the, the third time, I said, "All right, uh, instead of just getting surgery every time, uh, so that I'll be whittled away to just a lymph node in in ten years from now, and then cut that." Can we have a plan? And so they put me on a, on a chemotherapy uh, treatment plan uh, where I, I received radiation, um, heavy dose of radiation and then, um, uh, chemotherapy treatment for the past year. And I should be completing that uh, in about four weeks, so next month. And I'm uh, looking forward to that and hopefully been clear, just uh, like Marla had been, been clear uh, for a while now and hope to stay clear. Talk about an ordeal and a challenge. Going through these treatments obviously is a challenge. And now you're in this pandemic situation like all of us, but I guess the two of you are slightly more vulnerable than most of us, aren't you? Um, tell us um, what are some of the effects on the, of the pandemic on your daily life and how is it different now than it was before? Um, Blaze, do you want to start by telling us something about that? Sure. Um, yes, it is. It's much more challenging. Um, I I go in for my blood work every two weeks. Um, it's been consistent now, but um, it's very low. So my white blood cell counts are low. All my um, you know, effects are, are very low. Um, not where they need to be, but they're stable. Uh, that being said, I, I'm more prone to infection or whatnot. And so the challenge has been, of course, to be extra cautious and careful. And as uh, Cheryl will tell you, I'm, I'm still 25 years old in my mind. I'm still Superman and I, I affect me. And uh, so it's, it's exceptionally challenging now to be 
much more cautious, uh, more staying at home. Uh, when you go out, you're wearing your mask, uh, gloves, whatever you can to make sure you're, you're safe. But even then, there's a, a, a feeling, a sensation of just uh, anxiety that, you, that I didn't have previously because I, if I did get the flu, it's three days I'm in bed, I'm not feeling so good. Now, coronavirus is much, not just the flu, it's much, uh, much more severe. And in my situation, um, it's, uh, it can mean death. And so it's, it's very scary. Um, uh, but at the same time, you need to live and you want to live life. So you just have to really be safe and think a lot more about just common endeavors of just going outside. And that's a challenge. Yeah. Marla, how is it for you? Um, what is it different now than it was before? Now that we've been we're in this pandemic situation, tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think I mean everything is different for me since my diagnosis, um, and this is just like uh, on top of what I already was experiencing on my journey. Um, it was just like kind of crazy upon crazy. And in, in some ways, I kind of felt like this was uh, others joining me in my quarantine. I was, I was very careful throughout treatment uh, to stay, you know, to stay healthy. My numbers, my white blood cells and all my blood work has always been really good, knock wood. Um, they've stayed strong. So I haven't had to, you know, hole up in my house. And since treatment is over, I have a real strong sense of staying safe with my mask um, at work. I, I still work. I've been working in the library. I wear masks and gloves constantly there at the library, and the mask stays on whenever I'm inside the house. Um, but also, I, don't, I, I have a perspective that I don't want to stop living. Um, you know, finally out of treatment, and so... Uh, while I'm cautious, I don't stay at home and, you know, and, um, and let that anxiety get to me too much, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, didn't you tell us that, or tell me that you had actually taken a trip out, out of town recently? Right. It was a tough decision, but as you mentioned, my, my stepdaughter, Rebecca, and her husband had a baby, and that was our first grandchild, and I was just, we were supposed to go right as soon as the baby was born, and that didn't happen because that was in uh, March, end of March, and we just, we waited, and we waited, and we just simply couldn't wait any longer. I'll put it on me. I couldn't wait any longer, so we did uh, in, I want to say it was in May, before my treatment ended. Uh, we, we bulked up. We, I mean, you could barely see my face, but we took an airplane. Uh, we were only one of maybe 10 people in that airplane, so that was that worked out okay. Uh, very surreal situation in the airports and everything. And we, we traveled to Boulder, Colorado to see the grandbaby. And uh, we came back and thankfully everybody remained healthy. And, and we do plan to see the baby again, uh, probably Labor Day and wow. go again. Yeah, but it's scary. Yeah. It's scary, but we're going anyway. It's kind of, you know, that's been my motto is just keep on keeping on, you know? Well, you know, there is a considerable amount of debate about how to stay safe, how to counteract the economic effects of the pandemic and when and how to open up. What do you think? What's your perspective, Blaze or Marla, either one of you? I, I think that uh, it's unfortunate. It, it, the things that opened up, um, I was happy, to, I was happy about that because it means I got to go out a little bit, but, uh, not everybody's following the rules and, uh, that's causing a lot more problems out here. So I'm not sure if we're going to have to close everything down again or what, but I do worry. Um, you still walk around and see people without masks and people not following the rules and that's bothersome and that's very troubling for someone like me and, and Blaze. So you sort of feel as if, if everybody did what they're supposed to do, there might be some things that could be safe to open up, but yeah. people yeah. 
aren't considerate as they should be sometimes. Is that it? It's wor yes, it's worrisome. Uh, you know, I, I recently had a situation at work where somebody came in, one of my coworkers, I don't have many, I have six coworkers. Um, one of them came in and her son had tested positive for the COVID virus and she came in and she hadn't been tested yet. Mm. So that was really, you know, I had a lot of emotions, a big range of emotions from anger to hurt because they knew, you know, they knew what I was going through. Um, I worked throughout my treatment. I would take a week off for chemo and then, um, and then go back to work two weeks and then have chemo again every third week. So they knew what I was going through and to come in and put me and others at risk is troubling. Blaze, what do you think about all this? Uh, well, it is troubling. I'm concerned. I, I think a lot of times what we're doing is we're looking uh, at the cart instead of the horse or whatever for that analogy in the sense that, um, you know, I, I, we locked down and I think about 9-11. Um, we, we shut down the airports and no planes were flying. And we didn't allow those planes to fly until we set up security uh, efforts in all the airports and so on. We restructured quickly to be able to make sure that that doesn't happen again or, or similar uh, in the very near future. And then long term, we started working on other security efforts. Uh, same thing with this. I, I think we, we closed down, but then we didn't really uh, do anything about the infrastructure. The PPP, PPE, I'm sorry, wasn't coming out to the hospitals as quick as it needed to be. Um, the healthcare providers don't, still don't have uh, the necessary tools they, ha they need to uh, really you know, affect uh, this coronavirus and, and, and really kind of uh, quell it. Governments and uh, businesses really didn't understand what to do and nor do they have the tools still uh, to really uh, hand out masks or, or gloves when needed. So we, we locked things down, but we didn't get the infrastructure set to uh, come out with, a, with an effective, safe uh, way. And so then when we opened up, we're still kind of back to where we were. Um, and now everybody's going to restaurants and whatnot. The PPE is still not available. And so hospitals are starting to uh, get inundated again um, with everybody coming down. So I, I just wish we would look at the, the bigger picture and, and the, the horse, if you will, not just the card, not just ourselves. And, um, and then, yeah, we could open up a little better if we had better infrastructure. And like you said, uh, Marla, just have everybody just do their part. You know, in World War II, I think we talked about earlier, the visual effects. World War II, it, that was the motto, do your part. And people did. Because we saw a war. We saw tanks and bullets and so on. Here we have a war, but it's not as visual. And so people just aren't, doing their part and they're not masking up, gloving up, uh, or taking care of the safety needs that they need to and that affects us all. And that's, that's the troublesome and worrying part and I think that'll change, but it's gonna take more months of, of this before it does for the vaccine. Well, and we, we've even seen people you know, marching in the streets and protesting, how can you tell me what to do when you're telling me to wear a mask? We wanna have business as usual and you're not letting me do that, does that, how does that make you feel or what do you think about those kinds of protests and, and expressions? Well, it's just, it's, it's a, um, <laughs> a narcissistic look. It's, it's, well, I, you're not doing it. So why should I type of thing? And, and, uh, if, if everybody could just think about others, uh, you know, it's, it's not necessarily about you. It's about stopping the spread and, uh, having others be infected as well. Um, people, uh, there's a big patriotism going on right now. Uh, and really, if you're patriotic or if you, if you care about others, you would wear a mask. Um, and not just for yourself, because you have the right to not wear a mask or the freedom to not wear a mask, but wear a mask for others to make sure that they or their loved ones don't get sick. And in turn, it comes back around and, and it won't come back to you. But that, that mindset, I think, needs to shift a little bit from the, uh, the self-absorbed look, and really look outward. Well, and, and then there's the other, not side of the coin, but another coin where people were out in the street protesting about racial justice and marches for racial justice and changes to inequality to demand changes in society's awareness of bias, 
does that seem scary to you at all in terms of spreading COVID-19? What do you think about those? Again, if it's done correctly, Black Lives Matter, it's important to, to go out there and, and make awareness and, and protest, and, and we did. Um, but those communities also, the, the minority communities and so on, are being mostly impacted or more impacted by coronavirus than anything else. So if you truly care, you would protest, uh, speak up for uh, injustices, but also wear a mask, wear gloves, and, and make sure that you're taking care of what we're, what we're fighting for. Um, to go out there without a mask and without gloves, you're actually harming the cause itself. I, I feel. So it's just, did, you did, I, did I hear you that you went out and, and participated or protested? Tell us about that. What was that like? Yeah, uh, Cheryl, uh, girls, uh, Megan and Kira, we, uh, you know, we were very upset with, uh, you know, with George Floyd, uh, but with really everything that's been happening, um, in the thousands, and uh, just the injustices, and and it's it's a strong time now, and uh, that America, I think, has really started to come out, and we just felt the uh, the wave and the energy as well to to be a part of this. So early on, we were part of those the demonstrations, and we still are trying to do what we can to to make sure that that message continues on because we don't no one wants this to be just a, a one week wonder again um, like it has been in the past. So it's it's been great. It's been energizing. Um, uh, Marietta, you and I talked about what what keeps you going uh, after you've been diagnosed, and really, it's about. Uh, what can we do, right? It's, it's about putting those uh, uh, items in front of you to, to have a plan and, and a vision and really uh, you know, inspire yourself. And Black Lives Matter and the, the protests that came really are inspiring to see that finally, I think something is going to be done um, and it'll be a process. But we felt very energized about going out there and be, being a part of that. Um, and seeing this movement really starting to move forward, hopefully, and sticking. The, the that scary was a, part. A, part of, a part of you being engaged and having a mission and really living your life, but doing so safely as much as possible. How did you stay safe? Just wearing a mask and gloves, or were there other things? And trying to stay. We, uh, when we protested or marched uh, in the streets, we were staying on the very outside um, uh, parts. So we tried to keep the six foot distancing and and so on. Um, you, you know, we carry signs, don't shout as much, uh, perhaps, uh, again, you know, uh, sending out the, uh, you know, any kind of uh, aerosol virus type of thing. So we're, we're trying to stay as safe as possible. There's only so much you can do, as Marla was saying, you, you want to get out there, you've got it, you know, she's traveling on airplanes, you, you do what uh, you have to do, but you do it as safe as you can and, and um, you've got to keep forward. And, and so Mar Marla, did, did you or anyone in your family get out in, in that time when people were marching in the streets and protesting about racial inequality and, and police brutality? Yes, my, my daughter uh, has been attending um, protests and um, you know I'm really proud of her. She's never been one to be very political or uh, awake to these matters and she's really you know and my son too my son Sam um, you know posting all sorts of social media and really getting involved in learning you know about history and everything else um, my feeling is uh, my guess is that my guess is that things are not going to be as they once were and in, in a lot of ways and I hope that they're not and I'm really happy to know that there's going to be some changes made and I feel I feel that and I feel that and I you know I I think hope is a big part of not only uh, moving forward with our diagnosis and those that those others that have been diagnosed with cancer um, but also hope for our community hope for our world um, hope if you don't have hope you don't have much so I've been really energized by the protests you know, the signs I see in my neighborhood, um, the, the SCIC, um, social media campaigns. Um, 
I've been really, you know, I've been really motivated by that. And that's really helped me along my journey personally. Well, for, for someone who would be in touch with hope, both of you would know a lot about hope and being in touch with that, right? Yeah. So amid all the uncertainty that we have, I mean, will schools reopen? Will society be able to adapt to the new threats we face? today. Will there be a vaccine or effective treatments available? And when? you both seem to have a really incredibly upbeat attitude. So what resources have you really been able to tap into to keep this going, either spiritual or relationships or self-discipline? What keeps you going each day? Um, Blaze, do you want to start with something there? I'm um, sure. I, um, I've always... And not always, but last 10 years or so, I've, I've tried to uh, create uh, four circles that I want to look at almost every day. Um, those circles are me, my family, my community, and my world. Mm -hmm. And to see if there's anything I can do for preferably all four, four rings. Um, and when I look inside those, those circles or those rings, uh, that's where I can find my motivation. Um, what can I do for myself to be healthier, um, take walks, uh, ride my bike or whatnot? When I look at my family, what can I do to be together with my family more? What motivated me uh, when I was diagnosed, I went in for surgery. It was a, um, I don't know what the percentage was, but um, it's a good shot that I wouldn't come out of surgery. But um, I wanted to make sure that I walked my youngest daughter down the aisle, Kira, who's on the line. I wanted to make sure I, I uh, I showed my oldest daughter uh, the world of you know, highest mountains. So we're going to hike Mount Whitney and, and uh, hike Yosemite. Um, I want to make sure I, I do certain things for my family that, that I hope will, uh, will impact them in a positive way. I look at my community and the game. I was a volunteer uh, sheriff reserve for 16 years. Um, and uh, one of the things is do something for your community, vote at least. It's like, well, if you're not happy with the government, you know, do something yourself. So uh, recently I'm running for city council. Um, so, <laughs> Great. So Bravo. Bravo. those are the things that I'd look at to motivate myself to, so that I can, I really have something to look at next month, next year and beyond uh, reasons to live and you know, hopefully I can improve the world as well. And so those are my four circles that I look at constantly to put something out there, motivate and uh, inspire not only me, but my family, my community, and my world. Yeah. Arla, what about you? I can tell you that I, I don't believe I could have gotten through this last 14 months or so without my family, without my friends, without my faith. Um, without my rabbi, uh, it very early on when I was first diagnosed, I mean, you can only imagine how difficult that, that news is when you get that news out of the blue. I had a, just a regular mam mammogram scheduled and that's how I found out that I had cancer. So it wasn't something that I was expecting at all. It doesn't run in our family, you know, and, uh, sometimes in our mental um, cancer that I had so it wasn't in my you know in my genetics or anything like that anyway uh, very early on I asked my rabbi to forward me some prayers and some things that I can focus on throughout my journey and that helped immensely and also I'm a part of the cancer center uh, I'm in, I live in Long Beach and the cancer Todd Cancer Center here in Long Beach has you know the most amazing resources um, and one of them is, uh, it's called Beat the Odds program. And it's for uh, people that are living with cancer, surviving cancer. And I've been going to that group for months every Thursday, and now it's on Zoom. Um, but I still stay connected with them. And those are my, I don't know, I call them my tribe. Um, they've helped me through so much. And, you know, just bringing, I think that when you get a diagnosis, it really brings you closer to your nature of who you're supposed to be, if that makes sense. And this 
you know, these um, circles, my tribe has really helped me to become that person. So there's a lot of blessing to be had. A lot of blessing. So that almost sounds like silver lining talk, but you know, I think it's got to be part of the hope you talked about in the, the meaning and the engagement and the connections that are so valuable. Well, I do want to make sure we get to some of the questions that are in the chat box. So one of the questions is, um, do either of you worry that if you needed to go to the hospital, that they'd be full of COVID patients and unable to provide the care that you need? I'm happy to answer that first. Is that okay, Blaze? Yes, please. I was waiting for you. Okay, great. Um, I have been to the hospital um, during this time. I, uh, you know, uh, I, I just had my port removed. It was an outpatient surgery. Um, I've had medical appointments throughout this, my treatment. Um, it, you know, it's, it's kind of a necessary evil at this point. You know, it, I can't not have my treatment and I can't not have my, my, uh, my doctor appointments and things like that. So all, all, yes. Is it a worry? Absolutely. It's a worry, but you know, it's worrisome at the market too. <laughs> so I, uh, I, for my doctor, I know that um, my general doctor doesn't see anybody that's sick in her office. She only does physicals and checkups and things like that. Um, she, maybe she does uh, video chats with those that have any kind of symptom. So I've just trusted the process and uh, masked up distance. I was just today at the surgeon's office, um, and I, you know, I sat as far away from anybody else as I could. And I just think I'm just trying to be smart and do what I can. Beyond that, we don't have control over everything. So, but your doctor and your medical care is there for you when you need it. So far, right? Yes. Yeah, yes, and it's just one of those things. You know, I'm not willing to not see the doctor. I do, I have had some video calls with the doctor as well when it was called for. Yeah. Blaze, what do you think? Are you, are you, does that worry you that maybe you'll need to be there and they are so swamped or overwhelmed that they can't take care of you? Uh, yeah, a bit, but I'm, I'm a bit optimistic generally. Um, what I've seen when I've gone to the, the hospital and to the doctor's offices um, many times in this past year, um, is that everybody else there, you know, it's, hospitals are known for, well, that's where people are when they're sick, they go to when they're sick, and so you, you don't want to be there. But, but you know, going to, as, as Marla said, going to the grocery store or anywhere else, you have a lot of people going into a funnel. People, they don't have masks on, they're not very um, uh, precautionary. And then when they get to the point, they, they do realize they have to put on a face mask to get in or so. Whereas going to the hospital, Everybody is in a situation, or quite a few of them are in a situation where they need to be careful. And when you get there, everybody has their masks on. They are distancing themselves. Then the doctors really check your thermostat, or, you know, your temperature, and um, they make sure that you don't get past a certain barricade until uh, you've checked out with all the questions. You really uh, have a lot of safety measures in, uh, in place. And so in a sense, I do actually feel safer going to a doctor's office than I would to the grocery store. Um, so as Marla said, it's it's necessary evil that we have to do, but it's also um, very well uh, right now regimented and, and I feel safer than other activities. So you both feel safe there and you both feel as if you're getting what you need and you're not worried about things being so overwhelmed that you can't get it. Yeah. So far. And yeah, hopefully, hopefully we can keep the, you know, COVID down to where the, the hospitals don't get overwhelmed. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's the main concern. So far, it's, it's, it's everybody doing their part to make sure that that, you know, doesn't happen. I have to tell you, there. everybody probably has noticed there's a wedding picture in the chat box. If you haven't seen that, um, some people have looked at it and are just so excited to see that picture. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. From your daughter. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, um, go, go ahead. Uh, you know what, Blaze, tell us a little bit about something else that's been really motivating for you. I think you talked about being engaged. And you and I were discussing 
something called a We Are Game, which is a nonprofit endeavor that you've been involved in. Can, would you like to tell us what that is and what it means to you? Sure. Um, so yeah, we were talking about uh, some of the volunteer activities and We Are Game is, uh, uh, game is an acronym. It stands for Getting Athletes, Mentors, and Education. And um, right when I was um, uh, being diagnosed uh, with uh, cancer five years ago, I'd started uh, being a mentor to uh, a student athlete that uh, basically had uh, these student athletes that we mentored there. They come from typically blighted communities, um, uh, poor family situations, single parent, uh, tough situations. They really don't know what, what to do. They do know that they like a certain sport, you know, uh, women's softball, men's football, whatever. Um, but they just don't know what to do. And, and um, they never had any, uh, anybody in their family usually going to, to college or anything. And they really feel that they, they, they put a lot of hard work into it. So what we do is uh, when you volunteer, you become a mentor. And I was assigned uh, my first mentee, a guy named DJ Reed. And it was just uh, basically showing up. I didn't do anything, I felt, but I just went to his practices. And I found that I was the only one in the stadium that was watching. And he never had anybody watching before. So it was very motivating to him. And then we'd go out to dinner and we'd just talk and, and just simply talk. There wasn't any lecturing um, or anything, but it was just kind of understanding what, what he wants to do. Um, he was rejected a number of times from various colleges. He just wasn't good. He was undersized and uh, really not a, not a football candidate for college even. Um, Mentored him for a couple of years, and when I went through cancer treatment, again, my daughters were my biggest uh, inspiration, but uh, these athletes were, student athletes were also an inspiration to me. It's like, what, what will they become? And I want to see what happens. Well, DJ Reed ended up uh, graduating from junior college that we, we put him into, got a full ride scholarship to uh, Kansas State, four year D1 school, um, and just uh, through the mentoring, just he, he just learned certain things that uh, he used, and with those simple tools, he he ended up becoming the captain of the team. And because of that, he got drafted in the NFL, and he's on the San Francisco 49ers, and they were in the Super Bowl this past year. Um, and then you know, I got another mentee uh, after that, Elijah Walker. Look out for his name. Hopefully, he'll be in the Super Bowl someday. And uh, Trinell Ridgely is my my latest one. But these uh, student athletes are just amazing kids that, um, you know, they, they have two jobs. They're full-time students and they're full-time athletes. And they do so much, but they just, they just need some motivation, and some guidance. And uh, it's amazing how, how inspirational these, these, uh, these kids can be. And so that was a, that was a really nice uh, program to be involved in, still is. Uh, but I found that I believe I've helped DJ out um, as well as the others, but they've helped me out tremendously as well, just to, to keep me motivated and inspired. Oh, what a fantastic experience for them and for you, it sounds like, and that definitely has to be the definition of being engaged in caring and, and finding meaning beyond yourself, beyond your smaller circle, but looking at those other four bigger circles that you talked about. Yeah. Now, there's a great uh, question in the chat box um, that says, have you personally encountered anyone who says, I don't need to wear a mask, or this pandemic is a hoax? Mm -hmm. And if so, what did you say? Um, and if not, what would you tell them if you encountered such an individual? Um, who wants to Marla? Blaze? Oh, Go ahead. Um, I have. Um, I... I haven't said anything yet. Um, I, I was hiking uh, Mount Baldy three weeks ago and a gentleman uh, came from behind me and just said, you know, hey, take your mask off. And I didn't understand where that came from and I asked what the point was. And he said, you, you shouldn't wear your mask. And he started lecturing him about how hiking uphill, you shouldn't have a mask on and uh, all sorts of things. And, and I just, all right, pass me, go ahead. And he continued to uh, try to insist that I take my mask off before he passes me. He said, no, just pass me. And I just, he ended up finally walking past and, and didn't see him again. Um, I just try to 
you know, not just let it go and try, try to stay away. Um, because I don't know, I, I feel getting into discussions with these people are, are typically, they, they've got their mind made up, they have their beliefs or whatnot. And for me to say, well, it's kind of a selfish request that you have or, or you know, get involved in any kind of um, trying to educate, it's, it's probably not going to work. I, I, I'm on the fence about that. I, I think sometimes I, need, I should speak up a little bit to say, hey, it's not about you, it's about me or whatever. Um, some people said I should play the cancer card. I just, I don't know, right now, I just feel like just stay away and do what you need to do. Uh, and uh, let me go my way. And well, I'm, I'm sure it's hard to figure it out and to do it. Marla, what do you think? Have you either encountered something like that or thought about it? Yeah, oh, of course. Uh, I haven't encountered it. I've really, really um, been careful to surround myself with people that are aware of what's going on with me and, you know, support me. And so everybody around me is very, very careful. Um, and, you know, what I see on the news, for instance, you know, <laughs> with these folks who don't believe that masks are important or to see, you know, um, speeches where there's nobody wearing a mask in the stands. And uh, it's hard for my, my, to wrap my brain around that. And, and with regard to fighting, uh, I'm really, I'm, I use all my energy to fight for me right now. And I, don't, I try and live as much as I can stress-free. And so to get into it with people, it's just not my thing, especially now. I mean, maybe in the past I might have been different, but right now I really try and stay calm, stay smooth, and and go with the flow and just walk. If I were to account, encounter something like that, I would just probably walk the other way and take care of me. Oh, well, thank, thank you both for that. Um, but I'm going to turn the program over to Amelia in a couple of minutes and let her tell us about the council and some things that are going on and the programs that we're doing. But before I do, I'd like to just ask, is there any last word that you'd like to give us? Anything that um, you want us to take away from our conversation today? Some sort of a word uh, for each of us to remember? Um, uh I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to first shout out to my brother and my sister who's in the crowd. I can't see you because I'm not on the gallery here. I'm in my car after an appointment with the surgeon that ran late. Shout out to my tribe, my friend Meg, uh, getting me through everything, my husband, um, my kids. And with regard to the, uh, the pandemic, I do envision a, a better outcome eventually when, when all this is said and done. I believe that the world was off balance and I think it's, you know, there's some wonderful things coming out of it and um, it's definitely brought us, given us some time uh, to contemplate and think about you know, ourselves, our families, the world, how people are treated. Um, and I think that that's really a blessing. And so that's kind of how I view it. And that's what I would ask you all to, to, to think about beyond, beyond this conversation here. That positive Thanks. energy that you have and that you're, you're actually giving to us as a gift today. Thank you. Thanks, what about you? Any, any final words or last thoughts? Uh, similar, I'd say, yeah, stay motivated. Um, I, I stay motivated uh, within those circles. I look at my family, um, you know, Kira, Megan, my wife, Cheryl, they, they, they motivate me constantly. I, I look at the world, we, we hear the news, there's a lot of bad, but there's a lot of good. And if you, if you look at that, um, you know, you can really stay motivated and stay positive. Um, I think we talked about, uh, you know, one of the things that, um, uh, that we teach at in the game program uh, with our student athletes is you know what's simple things that you can do to to create positivity in the world um, and, and that comes back uh, uh, and I love things that are positive that are infectious and positive and so one of the things we, we talk about is you know, look at look at the best athletes actually not the best athletes look at the most successful athletes you know the Michael Jordans the, the 
baseball, Mike Trout, and those people, what do they all have in common? They smile. They smile a lot. You never find a picture without them smiling. And that's an infectious uh, habit to, to have. So you know, go out there, be positive, smile. And that's an infection that will come back to you. And it's good to have. And uh, just, just keep that and, and stay motivated. Uh, if, if, if you don't have the motivation, find something that will motivate you. Put out that goal. And uh, it not only motivates you, but it motivates others. And, and again, that's infectious. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Focus on the positive in the world because there's positive, there's negative, but if you focus on the negative, you almost enhance it to some extent. If you focus on the positive, that's where the energy flows. Is that a bit of it? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, Amelia, um, I'm going to ask you if you have any other questions or thoughts, but I also want to just thank you, Blaze, and thank you, Marla, because you are such inspirations to us, and we can't thank you enough for your time today and for the gift that you've given us to talk with us. Amelia? My pleasure. What do you think, my dear? Yeah, thank you so. I, I, you know, this is probably the one conversation that has flown by the fastest. I could, when you, when you, I was like, wait, what do you mean? Is it already over? But thank you so much, Blaze. Thank you so much, Marla. Um, it was, you know, for me personally, it was really important to have this conversation. And I, you know, there couldn't be two better people. I'm amazed by your optimism and your positive energy. Um, I love what you said about, you know, how it's it's a blessing to think beyond just yourself marlo what you were saying you know and have a have another perspective on everything and blaze the the comment about smile i couldn't agree with you more you know it's uh it's one little thing but my goodness it you know it it's it's one of the most transformative things that you can do to make another person feel better and yourself like you said so really from the bottom of my heart thank you both so so much um and uh Right. What was I going to say? Okay. So typically at this time, I share pro, uh, a flyer or we share a flyer uh, about our upcoming program. And to that end, uh, we have a little bit of a change, but, but fret not, we'll, we'll still be meeting. Um, but when we were thinking about these programs at the onset of this pandemic, we weren't sure how long the pandemic was going to be. And so we really wanted to make sure that we were being served, you know, some sort of service to our community, providing hope and inspiration and, and support. And so since March, we've been having three programs a week, you know, every week, three programs. And, and we've just kind of gotten to the point where it's becoming a little hard right now with just the logistics of also making sure that organization exists. And so uh, we changed a little bit and I just wanted to share that with you and I'll be officially sharing this through our social media and things. Courageous conversations will still continue, most certainly, um, but instead of every week, we'll actually have it for um, the first Friday of every month. We'll have the Courageous Conversation, um, and we still have an opportunity where we can gather together because we've kind of created a family amidst this Courageous Conversation. And so the second Sunday, we'll have Interfaith Cafes, again, via Zoom. The third week of the month, we'll have some type of a special program. Um, last time we did that program on, on just mercy and, and, the, and racism. And so similar things like that, that week will be allocated for that. And the last week of the month, the last Thursday, in fact, um, we're going to start back just like our cafes, our Religion 101. And we'll do that um, through Zoom. So more information will follow. So, you know, please, I know it sounds like a lot, but um, clear, concise information will follow about this. So we'll still have a chance to meet weekly if you'd like, but in terms of the courageous conversation itself, the next one will then be on the, where in July? Uh, maybe in July, August, the first Friday of August. And so once we have that confirmed, we'll be sure to, of course, send the information out about that. So thank you for that. And, um, and the other thing we always say is, you know, we know this is a challenging time for everyone. Um, it certainly is for nonprofits as well, but you know, we're trying our best. And if you're able to support our programs through any means, you know, any type of donation that you can make, would greatly appreciate um, you can go on our website and there's a donate button on the top. It is a bit un under construction. Oh, there you go, Cheryl. Yes. Um, so, but you'll see that little donate button. And if you're able to, that would be great. Um, if you're not, we ask you to please, you know, spread the word about these programs and about our council um, so that we can continue to be of service to people during the pandemic. 
that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Marietta, you're muted. Thank you, Neil. Thank you so much. I think it's taken us pretty much to the end of our time to be able yeah, to yeah. Blaze and Marla. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Cheryl, thank you. Oh my goodness. What would we do without you? We hope we never have to do without you. Yes. Um, thank you everyone for being part of these conversations every week for such a, a, a long time. It feels like a long time because it feels like we've talked to so many wonderful people. Um, but as Amelia said, we've kind of become a little family here on Zoom together on Friday afternoons. And we'll look forward to continuing those once a month. Um, but stay in touch, stay safe, and thanks again. <laughs>